Hello, Welcome, I'm back. Dr. David Hawkins. Welcome to another podcast of Mad in Love. I'm from the Marriage Recovery Center, and we're back for another exciting episode of da 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 da. Dr. Hawkins reacts. Today we have a special surprise for you. Joining me is my esteemed colleague. He's been here before, Jonathan. Jonathan Glover. Jonathan, welcome. Uh, Hello, thank you. It seems like we're in for something a little bit different today. Any hints about what Katie yeah. has in store for us, Jonathan? I am excited. She mentioned this idea to me a couple weeks ago, maybe even a month ago now, and I've been uh, having to wait uh, to see what what she has come up with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, the stage is set. Katie, uh, please enlighten us. What do you have in store for us today? So in today's world, artificial intelligence is a big deal in the techno technology world. And a lot of people are using ChatGPT to do a lot of info gathering. And I was wondering, just as you guys as therapists, what your answers would be compared to chat GBT, which is artificial intelligence <laughs> oh, oh my <laughs> word, are you kidding me? Okay. okay. So are so reacting, is Dr. Hawkins reacting to chat GPT? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, he is. Which I thought would be a little fun and it would be insightful to see how much information you could get from that's something that's systems driven versus someone who's alive and with a wealth of experience. I thought it would be a, a great, interesting take on it. All right, bring it on. Let's, <laughs> let's see what ch it's chat GBT. Did I get that right? And it's chat we... G G P T G P T. And what I'm going to do George Paul is for Thomas, <laughs> George Paul Thomas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. So listeners, those who are watching on our YouTube video, you can actually see what we're doing, but we will read everything out loud um, to give you an idea of what is happening on the screen. So I'm going to do that. Share. Could you see my screen? Yes. More or less. Okay. Okay. Well, what's going to happen now is I have some questions that I've gathered, just some main questions that a lot of people who come to the Marriage Recovery Center ask. And we're going to ask them one by one in ChatGPT and see what they spill out. I have it typed in, in here. Um, what are the signs that I'm a victim of narcissistic or emotional abuse in my relationship? So mm -hmm. let's go ahead and push the green button and see what happens. You've not seen these answers, right? I. I haven't, so I'm reacting to it as much as you are. <laughs> Boy, George Paul Thomas has a few thoughts on this matter. He sure does. Okay. Uh, this is going to take a week to get through this. Oh, my word. I do oh. like that it starts with, I'm not a mental health professional. Yeah, That's yeah. nice. And then it gave us some signs and we could go through the main points. So the first one, manipulation and control. The abuser may use manipulation tactics to control your thoughts, emotions, or actions. They might guilt trip you, play mind games, or use gaslight gaslighting techniques to make you doubt your own perceptions and reality. So far, how true is that? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I'm impressed. I would, uh, George Paul Thomas, I'll, you're hired. Bring them, bring them on. I, what do you think, Jonathan? I, I think it's. Uh, I, I want to talk about gaslighting at I, some point because it. I, that, I don't. That's a, I, I'm scanning that's a, this list of manipulation, control, constant criticism, isolation, emotional vo vo volatility. Um, sorry, it's very small. Uh, lack of empathy, constant need for admiration, blame shifting, intense jealousy and possessiveness, emotional withdrawal, and fear and anxiety. Um, I my first thought is this is actually a really good list um, for uh, naming abuse. Um, I I want to go back to the question that was posed though, which is what are signs that I am a victim of this? So yes, that's one. One focal point could be on naming the abuse and focusing on the abuser or the perpetrator of the abuse. Um, I would be, mm -hmm. as a therapist, more interested if this was the person in front of me posing the question, I'd be more interested in asking how it's affecting them and how they are doing what is showing up with them. Oh, I like that. It's a, it's a great point, Jonathan. These are 
all signs and symptoms of the abuser. They use manipulation and control. They are constantly critical. They use isolation. They are emotionally volatile. They lack all those things. Yes, yes. So that's the abuser. But uh, great a, point. It, uh, at jo- the end, it, it, where it says fear and anxiety, that is... I fear think, and anxiety, to yep. To the victim. Yeah, so it it really didn't give symptoms of the victim of emotional abuse, and those uh, I don't do. We, do we want to change the question to George Paul Thomas because uh, so we would good catch on the technicality there, Jonathan. It really does a very poor job of stating well the victim of emotional abuse. She, he feels exhausted. They feel invalidated. They feel very vulnerable. Their reality has been questioned. That number 10 is the only one that really does capitalize on it. They are riveted with fear and anxiety day in and day out, I might add. And then it's all cumulative over time. So we we think a lot about overt versus uh, covert emotional abuse. And that covert abuse happens in the cracks and crevices of a relationship day in and day out. And in fact, it takes a lot to even see it. But the victim of emotional abuse, I like to say this, a victim of emotional abuse feels the abuse long before they can identify exactly what is it that's happening. So they feel abused. They feel anxious and threatened and vulnerable and frightened. And that cumulative takes a tremendous toll. So I don't know, Katie, do we want to, do we want to challenge uh, GPT and say, wait a minute, what, what are the, what are the real symptoms that he, we, she experiences? We can, but as you're talking, I kind of had a question of my own to you, Dr. Hawkins, just because yeah. we're talking about the difference of signs you could see in a person who may be either the abuser or the victim of emotional abuse. As a therapist, is it harder for you to identify a victim of emotional abuse or is it harder to identify a narcissistic abuser or emotional abuser? Yeah, for for me, that's a great question, Katie. For, for me, having done this for years and years and years now, it all jumps out at me. The The victim, the symptoms and signs of a victim jumps out at me. And the signs of uh, an abuser who invalidates their mate and who twists their words and who manipulates their words. So I can see it again and again and again. I just had a session not long ago. I I have them all day, every day, so I'm not talking about anybody in particular. But um, it's very, very common for someone who's an emotional abuser, for example, to take the other person's experience and twist it and to make judgments and accusations. And there are sarcastic put downs. And so now me as a trained listener, like I cringe, I go like, Ooh, ah, yikes. Ooh, ah. And cause it happens so continuously. So anyway, that was a long answer. Uh, both, both the symptoms I can watch and see, Typically, I will use the gender she because 90% of our uh, victims of emotional abuse are she. So I'll say she in this instance, but it could be he. Anyway, she gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And I can watch that if I do a couple session and he gets larger and larger and larger. And I can see that in a session and I can see her feel diminished. And she will express that in one form or another. She'll become anxious and withdraw. And he takes on a larger persona. So I don't know. What do you think, Jonathan? You want to tackle that? Do you see, is it easier for you to see the symptoms of a victim or the abuser? Or like me, do they do they both jump out at you? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think that to some degree, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think that a lot of times um, both or either um, jump out at me. Um, I think coming from an addiction um, framework, I I think that a lot of it also depends on the stage of change um, that the the person may be in, how much work that they've done previously, um, like their their awareness level. Uh, But 
I actually, I also find that meeting with both halves of, of the couple, I get much more information a lot of times about what is actually going on. Because when you just hear from one person, sometimes it's, it's on point, it's accurate. They're, they're naming things. They're, they're doing a good job of, of identifying those things. But, um, a lot of times it's not until I get the other, the other half um, where a lot really does come to light. I, I want to follow up on that question. I know, Katie, you got some other questions for us, but Jonathan, do you find that you see the abuse more when you watch the couple uh, interact in front of you? Because I do. I mean, I hate <laughs> yeah, to... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I, that's, that's I mean, awful we, we, because I don't want to put... Uh, especially in exactly in a, a very exactly. abusive relationship, I wouldn't want to put the victim into that position in order to give me information. But but a lot of times that's that is the eye opening, and sometimes I only need seven minutes. But I I mostly only need seven minutes, and and people raise their eyebrows at that, like what what? But it, it happens very quickly. The covert emotional abuse. And exactly right, Jonathan, we would never want to put a person in a position of being harmed just so that we can accurately evaluate. But it is in watching the dynamics between them that I do see these these issues to play out right in front of me. And I'm able to very quickly say, oh, my goodness, I can see patterns going on here. And then I will ask them, folks, here's what I just saw. Is that a pattern? Do you folks? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that happens. All... Anyway. So, yes. This, this is a fascinating topic because we have so many people who call in and they're so scared of going into a session and being seen as the abuser after years of abuse because of that reactive abuse that you talk about, Dr. Hawkins. So they don't always react in the most healthy way because they have been abused for so long. So they're worried that if they go into a session they're going to be looked at as the one who has NPD. They're the problem because yep. it's worked yep. on them. Now you and, and Jonathan, both of you specialize in the world of emotional abuse, narcissistic abuse. So you're, you're trained to look out for those signs. Is mm -hmm. this difficult for a marriage counselor who may not have the specializations to miss those signs? It, Katie, it, it's shocking. It's alarming. I'm discouraged at how often I hear that, you know, at the marriage recovery center, you know, we, every referral, every referral comes in and says, Oh my goodness, we've gone to this number of counselors before. And I'm not, I'm not here to poke at uh, counselors, but they, they come in with that premise the the previous counselors have missed it. They have seen it as a two way street. They've been told it takes two to tango. Um, by the way, there's a term out there. I don't know if I made up this term, if I read it or heard it, but the term is mutualizing. It's a mutual deal. Come on. I mean, you know, it takes two to tango. It's a, it's a two way street. We both contribute to anyway. And who doesn't have that desire to mutualize? I'm married. I, I get it. I, I have a tendency at times to want to mutualize. Hey, honey, you know, we're both this thing. We're both that thing. We're both. No. So, no, when the couple comes to us, it typically isn't a two-way street. I want to go off on a quick tangent about the topic of charm. I, it, So many couples, she will come to me and she'll say, yeah, I'm really concerned that he will be so charming and that you will be fooled. And I don't know if it's just me. I want you to react to this, Jonathan. I say to her, like, I've I mean, no offense. I've met with you guys like five or six times. I don't think he's charming. I don't. I don't see. I don't. I don't see any charm at all. You know. I mean, no. I thought he was bombastic, controlling, argumentative, and sarcastic. And I mean, I still want to work with you both, but that there was no charm. I don't know what you're. Oh, you. No, you don't know. He. Oh boy, he can just charm the socks off a previous. Well. I don't know how, because I don't, I didn't see much charm. So Jonathan, do you have this, a similar reaction or are you, uh, are you fooled by, do you ever get fooled by no, I've his heard that charm? Before. I've heard that before for sure. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of the last charming client that I worked with. 
I, it, they don't yeah. appear charming. It I, the, all the words that you used, it's it it appears manipulative and um, disgusting, frankly. Yeah, mm. yeah. That so that's I don't know if this is unique to us because we see it, we're ready for it, we're trained in it, and so what might to some other counselor appear charming or I don't know, it just does not come across it doesn't play doesn't play as charming and and yeah well and going back to what you had said before i yeah i've i've said this before i'll keep saying it but you know i i got into therapy um initially doing a lot of work in the area of trauma and abuse um i did not go into counseling to do couples counseling but ended up realizing that everybody lives in the context of relationships, whether or not it's parent child or spouse or larger family units and needed to study how to work with, with those relationships better. But when we're talking about uh, abuse in a relationship, there's no two way street about that. There's when you're talking about abusive behavior, there's, there's a perpetrator and a victim period. I want to say a little bit more about that. Jonathan, so, <clears throat> so a couple things. Number one, we're trained to do mutualizing. So I get it. I get it. We're all, anybody who's taken, got a master's degree or a advanced degree in counseling knows about the importance of t- t- meeting people where they're at. And if they walk in the door and they say, we want couples counseling, then we're probably going to give them couples counseling and, and we're trained to see it as a two way street. And so it takes, it takes some real thoughtfulness, like you say, Jonathan, to say, well, wait a minute, you may be thinking it's a two way street, but if there's an abuser and a a perpetrator and a victim, we need to have our eye out for that. And I, I like to tell couples that I think about triage. So meaning in the field of abuse, we, we need to take care of the abuse before we do any couples counseling. We need to make sure that there's not a powering over dynamic taking place. If there's a power, more powerful person and a less powerful person, there's a dominant person and a, someone who's been marginalized. So we've got to take care of that dynamic first. I'm not sure other counselors, if they're not trained in the field of emotional abuse, and that's what we're all about. We're all about trying to in fact, we're going to be doing that more and more in the future. We're going to train counselors in the field of emotional abuse so and narcissistic abuse. So it takes real training. And then I think with real training, we have a different mindset that we come to the problem with. Love it. All right. Are we ready to challenge chat GBT? Yeah. Okay. So our original questions, what are the signs? Okay. So how do we want to phrase this? Thank you. Oh, 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 we're thanking Thank you. George Paul I Thomas. I am looking for signs within myself to see if I have been a victim of emotional or narcissistic abuse. Does that sound like a good question? Yeah. Then say, now okay. say, come on, George Paul Thomas. Do a little well, he, better. He apologized for the confusion. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, here we Much go. Much better. Is a... mm-hmm. So we can probably just read the, the, just the list instead of going. The bullet through. points. Yeah. yeah. Each one. So we've got low self-esteem, constant self-doubt, emotional turmoil, isolation, walking on eggshells, guilt and self-blame, feeling controlled or powerless, emotional detachment, constant criticism and put-downs, fear and anxiety. Do we want to look at any of these a little bit um, more closely? Oh, they're all good. Um, I I would like to highlight uh, constant self-doubt. I'm going to I'm going to piece them together, comma, constant self-doubt, comma, emotional turmoil, walking on eggshells. I think those would be, and low self-esteem, I would put those all, all together. And, 
certainly the victim of narcissistic and emotional abuse, they have, they learn to doubt themselves. They, and, and the question is often asked, why haven't you come forward with this sooner? Why haven't you uh, shouted for attention? Well, because I've been invalidated again and again and again and again and again and again and again. So all of my reality has been challenged. So come on, it's a two way street, honey. Oh, come on. You're, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Come on. It's not as bad as you think. Come on. I'm not doing that. You are. Come on, come on. This constant pecking at them. And is there any misunderstanding about why they would experience self doubt question themselves and come into our practice saying, I, I I don't know if I'm really the victim of emotional abuse. I think I am, but boy, he sure tells me that I'm not. So what do you all think? Jonathan, what do you think about the the three or four that I put together there? It's, it's good. I Would agree you with you. The, the, this list, you know, when, when Katie was reading those off, I was sort of thinking, well, what's the difference between, you know, I wanted something that specifically spoke to victim of emotional or narcissistic abuse, rather than say, childhood trauma, or borderline personality disorder, or something of that nature. And um, I think this actually chat GPT did a pretty good job of speaking to specifically relational trauma um, and the symptoms. And one thing that I would be asking a client about is um, when they noticed these things either showing up or, or increasing, um, especially in severity, uh, if, if, if they have a history of past intimate relationships, was this present, was this feeling present in those relationships with their, with their early relationships with their friends. So if somebody says, yes, this is, this has been true my entire life with everybody that I've interacted with, then I would have to kind of take a look at that more. But if they say, no, this is really um, exclusive to <laughs> my mother and my husband <laughs> or, you know, something like that, uh, mm. then, then I would say, okay, this, this, this is, these symptoms are seem like they are coming from the relationship itself, which needs, needs some closer look. I, I think that these symptoms really speak to something. I, I did a video a couple of years ago. Uh, I think the title of the video is a simple test of narcissism. And the simple test went like this. And, and I offer it to everybody listening right now. When you approach your mate with a concern about them. Are you received with gentle curiosity, humility, and understanding? Do they say, oh my, please tell me more. Oh my goodness, I understand. Right on. That's true. Is there ownership? Is there receptivity? Is there humility? And is there change? Or is there, no, wait a minute, no, 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 didn't happen, wasn't there, wasn't me, it was you. No, no, I'm not, I, mm, nope. And so if this person with low self-esteem, constant self-doubt, they approach their mate and say, I've got a concern that I want to, I want to bring to you because I want our relationship to be wholesome and healthy. I want us to resolve problems. I want to have a, a really connected, loving relationship with you. So I'm bringing a concern to you that, I, that I'm troubled by something that you're doing. And if they say, no, 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 just no, I can't, I don't want to hear it. So that happens again and again and again and again. And notice my hand that, that you're, you're, I'm invalidating you again and again and again. You're going to feel low self-esteem, self-doubt. You're going to be in emotional turmoil. You're going to be constantly on edge, anxious, and feeling emotionally drained. Let me say that one again, because that is a symptom that we see again and again and again. Exhaustion. Exhaustion. I can't resolve any problems with you. And so I begin to give up and I pull away and life takes on a a real negative quality. Absolutely. This, 
the, I'm looking at number four, isolation. And this is one that we don't talk about, I think, enough. Mm. Um, isolated from family, friends, or support networks that could be uh, clergy, church community. Um, the, this the, this one's huge. Um, mm. And and I think I see it a lot. And it's something, like I said, I think it's maybe something that I don't talk with clients a, about enough. Um, but this is something that's really, on, on one hand, th this is, it, it often takes place over time. So uh, the victim goes to somebody to say, here's what's going on. And yep. uh, they might go with, with their, their spouse. And then there's this story, this here's, here's, here's what my side of the story is. Here's what's going on. And there's a lot of this secondary abuse that occurs the other thing though that happens is that the 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 perpetrator of the emotional abuse um all of their opinions and thinking errors about their spouse about their victim leaks out in their speech really and true good point no matter who they are with um and all of their opinions about themselves leak out in their speech and so being around them enough a lot of people, children, parents, like I said, clergy, other other uh, family friends start to sort of take this on and they hear it enough like, oh, she's just over emotional. And, and oh, here mm -hmm. we go. There she is being emotional again. Uh, and this is the one thing that I, I find that people this is what keeps victims in emotionally abusive relationships, um, oftentimes because of the fear of even further isolation. And I've spoken with, unfortunately, a lot of, of women who have left their marriage or left the relationship and then been punished by um, their communities, their family, their friends, their, their own children. And it's, it's really, mm -hmm. it's really disheartening. It's, it's sad to see, but it's, it's, it's not because of in that moment, that is the response. It, this has actually been built up over over years and years and sometimes decades. You didn't use a word, but I wonder if you might, Jonathan, and the word is scapegoated. Oh, absolutely. Would, yes. Would you would you speak to being being scapegoated? And then if you might, <clears throat> would you talk to us about uh, treatment of being unscapegoated? What that might look like. What does scapegoated look like? I think you said it, by the way. You didn't use the word, but... Yeah, well, yeah. now I'm stuck on your, your second question. That's an interesting one, to be unscapegoated. Yeah, I mean, that's what well, I have. Give, that's part of treatment your, for me. Yeah. Give your definition of, of scapegoating while I think about that second part of the question. Scapegoating, presenting your own... So, again, I'm going to use genders of he, she, but it wouldn't have to be that. But he goes out and he talks to his family and he says, you know, look, I... <laughs> I know I'm not perfect. I mean, I know I've contributed here, but I mean, she, you, you, you don't know the, uh, oh my goodness, she loses her temper. She blows up. I mean, uh, I, and, and I know I'm not perfect here, but um, she, and I know I'm not perfect here, but she, and I, uh, but then I say that I know I'm not perfect here. So he presents himself in the most favorable light while casting her in the most negative light. And by the way, you mentioned it could happen. We're seeing more and more and more adult children because many right. people who come to the Marriage Recovery Center, Emotional Abuse Institute, they are 45, 50, 55, 60 years of age. So there's children. And he has said to the children, you know, look, I know I'm not perfect here, but you, you, I mean, you've seen your mother. You, you know how she can be this and that and that. I mean, you've seen how critical. OK, scapegoating, presenting himself in the most favorable light and her in the most negative light. And it's a slant. And so she ends up feeling scapegoated. And treatment then is going to require the unscapegoating to occur. Yeah, the unscapegoating, the best, the best examples of this that I've seen have been for the, the perpetrator uh, to actually very publicly 
go to each person to all of these mm-hmm. relationships and to say this is what i've learned in my own individual work this is what i've learned about scapegoating this is what i've learned about emotional abuse and i'm looking back over the years and the decades and i realize that my messaging to all of you baked in throughout time has, yeah yeah has yeah given you these glasses to put on whenever you view her that's it and whenever that's it. you view our relationship but short of that um, I don't know if there is a good way to unscapegoat, especially with I'm thinking of some clients that I, I have worked with who have adult children who no no longer talk to them. They don't have access to them. They're not with their spouse or the spouse is completely not on board with this idea to to go and take the responsibility and say, this is what I've done. Um, short of that, I don't I, I mean, there's really that this is why it's so harmful because the victim really can't do anything, especially with other adults involved, and when they have very, very little or limited contact. With, with you, you I, I love your phrase baked in that, that, or, or we, we might say woven into the relationship. I want to remind everybody, when we talk about emotional abuse, we're not talking about an isolated incident. These aren't, this isn't, emotional abuse isn't 7, 8, 10, 12 incidences over 10 years. It ain't that. It is every single day diminishing the victim. Every single day in in many, 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 many ways. So unscapegoating means that this person, by the way, when I when I work with a a, a, per, a perpetrator on unscapegoating, it's got to be you, you've got to take full ownership for all of the ways that you have harmed her, and then we're going to go out and we're going to talk to people who need to know that these are all the I can now see with new eyes how I have now look at the list again how I have damaged their self-esteem by thising and thatting, attacking them, by diminishing them, by invalidating them. I have, I have created an attitude of constant self-doubt. I have created an environment of emotional turmoil. I have isolated them from their friends and family. I, okay, on and on and on. So that's going out there and cleaning that up. Can't be done. I've had people, Jonathan, who have said, okay, yep, yeah, I know that I've been abusive. I'm ready to go out and tell them I've been abusive. I'm sorry. I'll quit it. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's far, far more complex than that. Looking at all of the ways that you have been harmful and abusive and being able to name all of those ways and going to people who need to know and presenting the victim in a balanced light, in a healthy light, in a restorative light. Okay. That might, be, that might be a good segue to the next question I had prepared. Okay. Um, and let me go ahead and type it or copy it over. <laughs> this is, imp- I'm, I'm generally, I'm impressed with George Paul Thomas. <laughs> What's our next question? <laughs> Is there oh, is hope there... for my relationship if my partner oh. is a narcissist or is a narcissist? I don't know. It's narcissistic, but here is a very long answer. If anything, he is very thorough. My goodness. <laughs> See here. Um, dealing with a partner who is narcissist, who has narcissistic traits or personality disorder can be incredibly challenging. It's important to note that I am an AI language model and cannot provide personalized advice. I love that. (laughs) Recovering from a relationship with a narcissistic partner can be difficult because those individuals often struggle with empathy, have a strong need for control and admiration, and may resist acknowledging their own flaws or seeking help. However, every situation is unique. The potential for improvement in your relationship depends on several factors, including the willingness of both partners to address the issues and seek professional support. So here are some of the considerations. Recognize the dynamics. 
It's important to understand the dynamics of a narcissist of narcissistic behavior and the impact it has on the relationship. Educating yourself can help you gain clarity and make informed decisions. Then we've got assess the willingness to change. Dr. Hawkins, I feel like this is all yours. Genuine, genuine change in a narcissistic individual is challenging but not impossible. However, it requires a willingness on their part to acknowledge their behavior, take responsibility, and actively work on their personal growth. Without genuine motivation and effort, the likelihood of significant change may be limited. What are your thoughts on it, that? Yeah, yeah. I have a lot to say about that, as you, uh, as you guessed. But let's go back to the beginning. We won't do this right now, but remember, everyone, that uh, some narcissistic traits does not equal NPD. And where you are on that continuum makes a huge difference. So if you have some narcissistic tendencies, then that's different than having NPD. Their response, uh, George Paul Thomas's response, kind of leaned towards the diagnosis of narcissism. You know, they have a need for admiration and aggrandize, self-aggrandizement and so on and so on. Eh, not always. And you can be, you can, your relationship can be permeated. Remember my simple test of narcissism. My goodness, this person may not look real narcissistic, but if they are defensive and dominant and dismissive, the three D's of that I talk about a lot in my counseling, if they're dismissive and defensive, no, no, didn't do it, wasn't me. No, you can't talk about that problem if it pertains to me. I'm too fragile to, uh, no, no, I don't want to. Oh, okay, so point number two, it requires on their part to acknowledge their behavior this is going to take a really skilled clinician, by the way, to, uh, to say, here's what the behaviors are. It, it's covert stuff is subtle, and it requires people like Jonathan and myself to see, oh, 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 I just saw it. Did you see that, folks, where you just, you just rolled your eyes at what she said? Well, is that, that's abuse, Dr. Hawkins? If it happens again and again and again, it sure is. It sure is in validation. So taking responsibility, I have so many people, and I'll, I'll pause here, Jonathan, you can get a word in, but so many perpetrators will use this phrase, I own it, I own it, I did it, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I own it, and I don't want to hear about it anymore. Mm. I'm done with it. I did it. End of story. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, so so this willingness to acknowledge what they're doing, this is rigorous, hard, long-term work. And put a quick plug in that we have a core program, an advanced core program, a core strength program. This is not this is not 10 easy steps to rid yourself. So point number two is critical, and it requires a skilled clinician to say, here are the behaviors that are taking place. And by the way, let me remind you, there are attitudes that support all of these behaviors. Parentheses, read an attitude of superiority. In 90% of the perpetrators I work with, there is an attitude of superiority that has to be uprooted highlighted and dealt with. So anyway, taking responsibility and actively work on personal growth. Read program, read core, advanced core, core strength, individual work and couples work and so on. All right, Jonathan. Yeah, I do. You wanna, I, do you, oh, what do you think about number one and number two? Yeah, this, the, I'm, I'm thinking back on all the couples that I've worked with and thinking, okay, which, which of these couples um, really did make significant change and progress and where was their big movement? And then also thinking about the ones where 10 months later, they almost were in a worse off place. They were, it, it was, it was not good. And so, and I think that this, these first two, this recognize the dynamics, this, this mutual um, ability to say here, here are the measurable 
abusive behaviors. Here's the measurable dynamics going on. Um, the willingness to change is absolutely huge. I can say mm -hmm. I have, I have people, I have guys who come in during that evaluation session or during our first session meeting together. And he says, this is what I know that I'm doing. I think I'm doing more than that. I want to learn more about it so that I can stop. And, and then carries that mindset moving yeah. forward. And, and there's never a debate about it. There's, it's like that first hurdle of, no, you really are doing this. This is really what it is. And this really is the effect on her. Some clients get absolutely stuck in that arguing of this is abusive or it's not, or it isn't as bad as she's saying or what. And, and if you never get past that, there's no work to be done. There's no, there's no more change. There's no, there's, uh, there's, no I, I want to, I don't have a lot of hope for, for that. I want, I want to go, I want to go off on a really quick tangent, tangent. And so uh, plug a book that we're, we're writing our team. We're writing a book right now. And uh, chapter, the prelude is the title of the prelude is, so she's called you a narcissist. Now what? And step number one is get over it, <laughs> get over it. Don't come on. I don't want to spend six weeks talking about, well, I don't really like to be called a narcissist and I hate the word abuse and I don't like to think of myself that way. And I just don't, uh, you know, I've never liked the word. I mean, can I be a little angry at times? Yes. But I mean, I don't want her to ever, ever, ever call me the N word. Come on. She called you the N-word or he called you the N-word because it comprises, it's a short-term label that means a lot of things. And let's talk about all the things that it means. Why has that label been used? What are all the different behaviors? It, they didn't just grab the label because, you know, um, they just felt like grabbing the label. They grabbed it because it has some meaning. What's the meaning? Let's unpack it. Let's look at it. And then we can get on with the task of owning it. And then we can get on with the task of treating it. So anyway, a little bit of a this, rant there. But this fourth yeah. step, the, the fourth thing that chat that GPT mentions is the, the setting and maintaining boundaries. <clears throat> this is a really an important thing to mention, because even if uh, the perpetrator of harm, even if the perpetrator of the abuse is not on board yet, if, if, if they do not understand, um, or they do not have, if you do not have a common language for it, you don't have to have their buy-in in order to, mm. um, have and to set and to maintain and follow through with your own boundaries. Well done. I want to go back to number three and raise a huge red flag. Uh, George Paul Thomas, I totally disagree with you on number three. And the danger of number three, so George GPT says, a trained therapist, and I'm going to add a little tone here, GPT, not fair, but I'm going to add some tone. A trained therapist can help both partners navigate the dynamics and to work on communication skills, set healthy boundaries, and explore potential avenues for healing and growth. Really out of line. This is not... So the mutualizer comes in saying, it's a two-way street. We just got to learn to hear each other. You know, we've got to practice. We've got to practice active listening. That's our problem, Dr. Hawkins. It's really, it's really an us problem. I mean, yes, I, I know I've got, anyway, it's not an us problem. It, it could be an us problem. There are us ramifications, but GPT is way out of line on that one. What do you think, Jonathan? Are you going to support me on this, or do you have my back? Oh yeah, or you... yeah. Th this is the this oh. is the one that I, I have been eyeing and trying to figure out how to word that. But this is the one that Chat GPT cut and pasted into yeah, every yeah. response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Related yeah, yeah. to therapy. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Just I, learn I, how to communicate. Way. Learn how to listen to each other. That will solve all of your problems. It won't. Yeah, it George Paul Thomas got a little lazy on that. On that, got one. a little said, lazy on that. This answer from the other one. Yeah, yeah. So, Katie, are we is that good enough on that particular topic? I think we've 
highlighted for people that no, you, you don't want a counselor that it, it, by the yeah, a warning for everyone. If you walk in, if you're believing that there's been a narcissistic and emotional abuse and you walk in or zoom in on a counseling session and you hear them, the counselor say, yeah, yeah, we'll work on listening skills. We'll work on communication skills. Run, run, just run. Do not walk, run. There is so much truth to that, Dr. Hawkins, but it's also such a damaging process because they finally got their narcissistic spouse to go to counseling. Yeah. And then they went to someone who's not equipped to understand the dynamics. They're mutualizing. And the moment the wife says, the victim, whoever that may be, the victim says, this person doesn't know what they're doing, the the abuser now gets to say, oh, you don't want therapy unless it fits your narrative. You don't want to do the work. This person's saying you need to work on communication and you're running away from it. You just want to put the blame on me. I hear it time and time again on calls with clients when they call into the marriage yep. recovery center. And it is devastating because these, these victims of abuse are just at a loss. They feel like they have to start all over again to get that that rock up a hill <laughs> to get this yep, person yep. to agree again. But taking that chance, taking that risk to do that with someone who is not specialized in the field could really ruin any potential movement for them in their relationship. And, and g- great point, Katie. And what I love about what we're doing, I, I like it that, that people are coming in informed. It's typically she, she's watched the videos, she's read the books. By the way, everybody, guys, come on, she's read the books. I mean, does she have an ax to grind? I don't think she's got an ax to grind. She wants to be heard. She is seeking relationships. And that's her agenda. She's not not trying to just get one over on you. She's trying to highlight what creates her feeling diminished again and again and again in the relationship. So, yeah, I I, I hear you, Katie. So, but I, I, I hope that she will turn and walk out if there's a tendency on the part of the counselor to not really get the dynamics and understand triage, that there's an order to the way the issues need to be dealt with. Well, today with this particular podcast, we're kind of coming up on our time. So I think this is a great place to take a pause and do a part two of questions with chat GBT. What are your thoughts on, doc- on that, Dr. Hawkins? I think that's absolutely fine, Katie. So let's just thank everybody for being part of part one. And I, it, this is always a robust conversation. Um, you, you can tell that Jonathan has, he's a seasoned clinician and can be trusted. I'm, I'm a seasoned clinician. This is an incredibly complex topic, everybody. It's really complex. And I, I, I'm going to speak for Jonathan here. I don't think either one of us mind being dialed up ourselves. And we are dialed up. There are people that that send me an email later and say, wait a minute, you missed that. You missed that. You missed that. And, it, and it's, it's all true. So I hope that we will come across to you all that we're teachable. We're trying to learn. It, it's, it's, it's a relatively new field and it's really, really complex. So We appreciate all of you. And Jonathan, thank you again for joining us today. To our listeners, we want to express sincere gratitude for joining us on this journey. If anything we have discussed today resonated with you, please remember that we are here to support you. And we want you to learn more about what we're doing and about Jonathan and the ways that you possibly can work with him in the future. Visit our website at www.marriagerecoverycenter.com. Dot com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we greatly appreciate your support. Kindly leave us a five-star rating and subscribe to our channel to stay updated on future episodes. So your feedback and ongoing engagement means the world to us. We, we're, we're, we're listening. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, take care and be well.